I am pleased to be a participant in the 2017 Novo Subversk Scientific School on Inclusive Education. I look on NSPU as a university to which I belong. My presentation today outlines aspects of the history of inclusive education as I understand it developed between Russia and Canada. My relationship with NSPU has been personally and professionally rewarding and hopefully of value to those attending your scientific schools. I do not claim to have a firm understanding of what has occurred with regard to inclus inclusive education in Russia, though so my visits and discussions in Russia and with Russian colleagues visiting Canada have given me some ideas regarding the interaction of our two nations. I have had the opportunity to visit NSPU and other areas of Russia on a number of occasions. All of these visits were focused on inclusive education. These experiences allow me to get a sense of the development of inclusive education in Russia and to share with you what has occurred in Canada. We will display various things that are connected to the topics in our presentation. We also will follow up with more blog videos over the next few months. The beginning of inclusive education. We will spend some time on the first building blocks of inclusive education. The following details lay out the elements of the early plan for achieving equity in education for all students. It was in the early 1960s that a Canadian educator, Jim Hansen, who was responsible for the education program of the Hamilton Wentworth Catholic School Board in Ontario, Canada, became the first educator to place students with disabilities in regular classrooms alongside their non-disabled peers. He considered segregation socially unjust and began to include all students with disabilities in the same classrooms as all other students. The term inclusive education had yet to be con conceived. Jim's turn was each belong and basically meant to bring all students together in the same classrooms. Jim had a definite idea of what he meant when he began to include all students. He stated his beliefs in a cradle, his guide to socially just education for all. Here it is, each belongs cradle. Each person is endowed with the dignity of a person. Each person has equal value despite difference in ability. Each person has the right to grow and indeed, each person can grow. The limits of individual growth are unknown and should not be circumscribed. No person is static. Each is ever in the process of becoming. Each person is unique and unrepeatable. The beliefs we hold about people can serve as prison walls limiting us at every turn. They can also free us from the shackles that confront us to confront great new possibilities never dreamt of before. Inclusive education for students with disabilities was conceived in Toronto in 1988. John O'Brien and Marsha Forrest 
described how the term for change came about. Fourteen people from Canada and the United States who felt that integration of students with disabilities did not describe what they wanted for students with disabilities. Integration was part of the special education model and is based on segregation from other students with disabilities. Those at the meeting wanted all students to be educated together. The group of 14, which included educators, writers, parents, and adults with disabilities, all of whom had first-hand experience with segregated education, came up with the idea of bringing all students together under inclusive education, which did include all students. This was a radical departure from the idea of special education, but the term and, and the concept rapidly caught on, first in Canada and the United States, and then in other nations. Inclusive education is a term and concept now used around the world. Jim Hansen and those at the Toronto meeting clearly stated that each belongs and inclusive education were based on bringing all students together in equity. The global acceptance of inclusive education. Six years later, in 1994, UNESCO called together a global meeting in Salamanca, Spain to discuss whether to continue for students with disabilities under the special education model of segregation for students or to move to inclusive education, an approach considered to be more socially just. Following intense discussion, those at the meeting chose inclusive education and recommended it as United Nations policy. This policy was reinforced by the United Nations in 2005 by the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The CRPD made it clear that all students with and without disabilities were to be educated in the same schools and classrooms, no matter what differences occurred among students and that they were all to be taught by regular teachers. The policy of inclusive education for all applied to all students in all nations. A number of organizations in various nations led in initiating inclusive education. Russia and Canada were among the leaders with Canada being the first. Thanks to the work of Jim Hansen and the support of others such as the Marsha Forest Centre and York University. Leading Russian Canadian examples. The early work of Perspectiva. A short time after the United Nations began its support of inclusive education, organizations in Russia and Canada began to collaborate on advancing inclusive education. The first Russian organization to realize the promise of inclusive education was Perspectiva, the all-Russian organization led by Denise Rosa and her staff. One of the early steps taken by Denise was to attend the Marsha Forest Center's Summer Institute in Toronto and contact colleagues in Canada advancing inclusive education. This collaboration continues. I was invited to Russia by Perspectiva 
early in the new century. I visited their office in Moscow and other places over two trips. The first school I visited in Russia was School 200 in Moscow. During a school tour, I noticed a young boy with Down syndrome. As I observed the class and the boy, I saw, I saw a woman seated by the boy appearing to be giving support. In Canada, we would refer to that such a person as an educational assistant, a common support strategy in Canada. I was impressed with the understanding the staff had of how to apply inclusive education. During lunch, one of the teachers asked me if I had noticed the boy. I said, yes. The teacher went on to tell me that the young lad was the grandson of Boris Yeltsin. I was very impressed and I wondered what meaning this would have for education in Russia. I also visited an early childhood center in Moscow, one that I was told was inclusive. My opinion was that the staff were using the term inclusive education, but actually were using more of a special education approach. This is similar to the situation in Canada where some educators understand that no students should be segregated, whereas others still segregate many students with disabilities in favor of special education. At the same time, they claim to be inclusive because they do place some students with disabilities in regular classrooms. Such differences of practice from place to place is not unusual when a new concept challenges the one with which people are familiar. Certainly, that is the case in some areas of Canada. Next, I visited schools to the east of Moscow. In Ulan Uda, for example, I saw inclusive education in place in a variety of locations. In one school, I watched some classes at work where young students with disabilities learned along with all the other students. I also had opportunity to speak with an older student and to chat about inclusive education with him. He told me that he felt he was just another student and that the other students felt the same. I met with the principal and the staff members for an after-school discussion. It was clear that they understood the value of inclusive education and were not challenged in carrying them out. On the other hand, I also met with professors from a nearby university for a discussion on education for students with disabilities. They believed that educa inclusive education was a questionable approach to students with disabilities in comparison with the special education approach. Acceptance of inclusive education is uneven around the world, including Canada. I will not speak of what is happening across Russia now. You are the people deciding that. I do know colleagues in universities in Novosibirsk, Krasnoyarsk, and Moscow, as well as those at Perspectiva in Moscow, and have met others elsewhere who are active in advancing inclusive education. This progress is very exciting and offers critical leadership to the nation.
the Beslin School Siege. On 11 September 2004, terrorists attacked school number one in Beslin, North Ossetia. In the ensuing three days, some 172 students lost their lives, as did some teachers. When the siege ended, the community of Beslin decided that the school would be rebuilt as two schools and that all students and staff, including those students and teachers who were disabled, would attend the new schools. Joseph, Joe Whitaker, a longtime English colleague of the Marsha Forest Center, was invited to assist the parents and teachers to develop a plan to keep all teachers and students in the new schools. Joseph, Joe Whitaker, a longtime colleague of the Marsha Forest Center, was invited to assist the parents and teachers to develop a plan to keep all teachers and students in the new schools, regardless that the practice at that time was to segregate students with disabilities in institutions. The parents and school administration also agreed to include any students with disabilities in the Beslan area. Under the leadership of Joe Whitaker, the parents and school administration decided to create a program of inclusive education a program covering the philosophy and the practice of inclusive education was instituted. The Marsha Forest Center has heard that the schools were named after Joe. G8 preparatory meetings, Moscow, 2005. The 2005 G8 preparatory Working Group on Education for Students with Disabilities met twice in Moscow and again along with groups from other nations to present their final recommendations to President Putin. Among the Working Group on Disability and Education were representatives from Russia and Canada. The two earlier meetings of four days each were spirited with some groups arguing to stay with the special education model and other groups advocating for change to the inclusive education model. At the end of the two earlier discussion meetings, the majority opted for change to inclusive education. In the third Moscow meeting, the education group presented our rec recommendations to, for change to the inclusive education model. President Putin immediately accepted the recommendation. At the same time, a member of the Canadian representatives asked if she could approach President Putin and present him with a pin designed by Perspectiva with a message urging inclusive education. President Putin immediately said it would be an honor to wear the pin and allowed the Canadian representative to pin it to his lapel. The nation of Russia then began to put the mechanics needed for change in place. All of you in Russia who are preparing teachers and others for the future and those of you exhibiting leadership in school systems across Russia are to be congratulated.